This is Selma Schimmel for the group room at the 14th World Conference on Lung Cancer, WCLC, organized by the IASLC, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. We are in Amsterdam. And now we're going to talk about mesothelioma. And probably some of you are saying, that's cancer? Yes, and we're going to learn more with Dr. Harvey Pass, Vice Chairman of Research, Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery, and Chief of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at NYU School of Medicine. NYU is in New York City, United States. Welcome to Amsterdam. Thanks, Tom. So thank you for making time, because I think this is one of the cancers that the public really doesn't understand, because you hear mesothelioma, and the first thing you think about is the law firm that just advertised on television that if you have mesothelioma, give us a call. I think if you have mesothelioma before you call the lawyer, you need to call the doctor. That's pretty much correct. Um, priorities, you must think about your family, but at the same time, you have to think about yourself if you have mesothelioma. Uh, because as you mentioned, this is a rare disease. This is a disease of only 3,000 people in the United States and people uh, really don't know enough about the disease. And it is as devastating as any of the malignancies that we deal with, including lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. What exactly is me mesothelioma? It's a cancer that involves the linings. The linings are made of cells called mesothelium. So when they are disturbed by asbestos or other fiber types, uh, they will transform into cells that get out of control and you will then develop a constricting, thickening, fluid-filled area around your lung or in your abdomen that uh, is very rarely detected early. We understand that the greatest risk for exposure comes from asbestos. Yep. And when the general public hears about this disease, they associate it mostly with shipyard workers, people who work with brake pads. Can you give us some more background as to the whole history of, of, of how we came to understand the disease and what is unique about asbestos fibers? Well, it, was, it really started in South Africa with Chris Wagner, who showed that in the asbestos mines, the workers were developing this malignancy in the belly and the chest that really hadn't been described before. Finally, it was figured out that it was the exposure to the asbestos that was causing this disease of the mesothelium mesothelioma. And then through uh, a series of studies in the United States, uh, in New York, it was shown that insulating workers also developed this disease. And that was what, what year are we talking about? We're talking about 19... In the original, we're talking about the 1960s, and then in the 1970s, we have data that insulating workers are developing mesothelioma in the belly in the United States, and they were working with a type of fiber, and we then saw that, gee, we are underdiagnosing this disease, and that it is indeed people who were exposed to asbestos, boiler makers, people who were in the Navy, people who work in the construction, elect electricians, uh, that we commonly think about for that population. Certainly prior to the 60s, there were some kind of uh, fibers, you know, had been around for a long time. What was this sort of disease perceived as much earlier than that? It was, it, it was really mixed up. I mean, if you look in the literature and you look at the pathology literature about this, uh, they really didn't even classify it as some sort of tumor. I mean, they didn't even know how to classify it. Many of these were unclassifiable, and they really, and if you look at the records of the Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, you won't find the term mesothelioma used until much later. Is asbestos a natural fiber or is it a manufactured fiber? It can be natural, of course, and it can be worked on. And it can also be fibers that are asbestos-like that are natural that can then be mined or contaminate other things unknowingly. What is, when it, if it's natural, what is asbestos? Where does it come from? It comes from rocks. So it gets mined. So then it gets processed. And these fibers, when they get processed, different lengths, different sizes, different characteristics of their lining, uh, 
same as fibers in Turkey that are like asbestos, but they're called arianite. And they have the same sort of characteristics and they cause the same sort of disease, but... Turkey as in? As in the central port of Turkey called Cappadocia, where because people have lived for centuries in houses that the houses were built out of blocks from the mountains that contained arianite, and they live in those houses that there was this strange interaction between genetics and the fibers that one in one house, a family, 50% of the patients would develop mesothelioma, while in another house, nobody would develop mesothelioma. So some genetic link with a fiber and families, maybe. But f certain fibers have certain characteristics that will cause a reaction in the mesothelium to make certain pathways get turned on. What about fiberglass? Fiberglass is not, and in fact, uh, silicon, uh, s silica, dust, or fibers uh, do not cause mesothelioma. And in fact, when we do experiments, we use those as the controls, uh, so we don't develop or look at non-fibers that don't cause problems. So, asbestos is used in in insulation. It's used in boiler rooms. It's used in shipyards. It's used in um, tires, uh, uh, um, brakes. brakes rather. You'd be surprised. There, there are fibers like asbestos also that you'd never even think of. Insulation you, me you mentioned. Um, well, there, how about potted plants? What does that have to do with this? Well, it turns out that vermiculite is a type of material, that little puffball stuff that you put in for potted plants. That has to be processed. And it's mined, and then it gets processed into plants, and it gets popped. And it turns out that from certain of the vermiculite mines, they were contaminated with certain fibers that can cause mesothelioma. Now the problem is vermiculite is used a lot for insulation. So there are hot spots that can develop all over the world. Now I live in Los Angeles, so in it, certain homes or public buildings, it's not uncommon, we call them cottage cheese ceilings and other people have called them popcorn ceilings. We think it looks a lot more like cottage cheese. And in order to have that removed, you have to call in a licensed specialist, and they have to test the levels, and the potential homeowner, let's say, isn't allowed to move in until those levels are safe. But if you do not touch your ceiling, my understanding is that you're fine. It's when you start touching the ceiling and those fibers become loose. And That's correct when the fibers become airborne. Uh, and that's why you have people like the, uh, the, the, the government will come in and do actually testing of individual places to see what the fiber analysis is of the ambient air. And if it's above a certain level, then that's not good. So let's talk about the cycle of this disease and how does the disease present, what drives the patient to finally go to see their, let's say, their primary care physician? Well, usually the patients present with a sudden onset of shortness of breath. Now, maybe it won't be sudden, but over the last four months, uh, dad or granddad started to get short of breath, and they can't figure it out, and they used to be climbing mountains, and now they can't. So they present to the hospital and they get a chest x-ray and sure enough there is a bit of fluid in the lung or around the lung known as a pleural effusion and um, needs to be looked into and maybe somebody thinks congestive heart failure or some other problem, maybe had a little bit of pneumonia and we'll, we'll, we'll treat it with antibiotics and tap it and we won't even, yeah, and think about it. And the fluid goes away, the patient feels better and um, unfortunately that's not the end of the story. So unlike many of the other related lung cancers that we're discussing at this meeting over these days, this does not have the genomic or the genetic mutation component. This is really related to environmental exposure. That's a great question and a great segue. I mean, indeed, there are many genomic things that happen to these cells that are abnormal. But to find one specific mutation like 
we have inf found in adenocarcinoma in certain populations like, and that we can use Tarceva. Uh, we haven't found that. We just find so many changes. We look at how many chromosomes are affected by deletions or translocations or mutations, and it's all a jumble. So we haven't found specific targets yet, but there are multiple, multiple changes. There are some that are common, uh, but we haven't been able to exploit those for either treatment or for early detection yet. How do you treat the disease? That's one of the big controversies. Some people think that you shouldn't even treat the disease. And maybe if somebody even presents with mesothelioma and it's early, maybe it's justified to wait a little bit because we don't know what's going to happen to that patient because there's variable biology. Some mesotheliomas can grow very fast and some mesotheliomas are a little indolent, slow. But the bottom line is that the median survival of this disease, if you don't treat, is nine months. So I'm a very proactive treater. Uh, and if you can combine elements of treatment in a, in a multimodality way, surgery, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, depending upon the patient and the patient's function and how much tumor burden the patient presents with and what the patient can tolerate, then for an early mesothelioma, it would be good to think of chemotherapy either before or after an operation to try and remove the disease so you can't see it, and then maybe some radiation therapy. But unfortunately, only 15% of patients will present with that modus that's good. What is the chemotherapeutic agent that you use for this disease? Olympta, Pemetrexid, uh, is the drug that has been shown to have a 40 percent response rate, which compared to some of the older drugs that we used to use before the big randomized trial that showed that, we had response rates of 10 to 15 percent. Is there metastatic, a metastatic component to this disease? There is. The biggest problem, though, is local control. The disease, even if you try to eradicate it locally, comes back 95% of the time. And, but it can come back locally or it can come back systemically. And in the later stages of the disease, it can absolutely metastasize to the opposite lung, to the opposite pleura, to the abdomen. I think what I'm trying to understand is that if the disease is initiated by exposure, let's say to asbestos or these fibers, logically you would think of it as an obstructive disease. How does it transform itself into a malignancy? If we have another two days, we could really figure that out. Uh, what I can tell you is that there are a series of steps that asbestos will probably make the cell make certain, right. certain secreted products mm -hmm. that are danger signals that recruit other cells in okay. that are trying to take care of it. And then those other cells will secrete things like oxyradicals or free radicals. And then you're, you're making the cells a little bit different. They're a little bit different. They're a little stronger. They're, they're fighting this off It's a domino now. effect. That's correct. A series of genetic or environmental mm -hmm. events that make these cells that should die from the asbestos. Asbestos should kill these cells. Some of them do not die. They become stronger and then they create an inflammatory reaction which feeds them. They grow more and more. They get a blood supply and what before you know it, you're implanting your whole chest. Dr. Pass, this is really scary. Well, that's why we have to find it earlier. How do you screen x-ray? Is um, spiral CT uh, effective? I wish. Uh, you have so many people who are exposed to asbestos. We don't have, we can't, it's very difficult to ask somebody, what was your asbestos exposure? Unless somebody works in the, in the industry. And we're seeing some people who don't work in the industry who are getting mesothelioma for some reason. I understand also that children, as an example, whose parents may come home and it's on their clothes, What's the frequency of, of that kind of spread, you know, secondary exposure? Absolutely. One of the, it's actually the wives of, first of all, of the men who worked in the plant or worked in the Navy and bring home the clothes and then they washed the clothes or worked in the break, the, you know, they were auto mechanic and they brought, brought home the stuff. And the, and the wife will develop mesothelioma.
and not the man. So why is that? Why is she more susceptible? So there may be an underlying element of you can fight it to a certain extent because of certain genes that you've got, and and he, he, she didn't have the genes he did to fight it. So who? How do we figure that out? So how do we how do we figure out the risk population, and then how do we screen for it? So well, we understand the um, the lungs and the the lining of all these tissues uh, in the upper airway, upper chest. Where's the esophagus in all of this? We relate to the esophagus or, or think of the esophagus as upper GI. Why don't we get mesothelioma in the esophagus? I mean, you know, which is, you know, it's sort of you inhale, it comes in, you swallow. Uh, what happens to the esophagus with this? The esophagus doesn't get affected mainly because that's not mesothelium. So this is a targeted bombshell to a certain type of cell that seems to be more susceptible to these fibers than others. And that's where we have to figure out what makes this so susceptible and how do we take care of that. But maybe you swallow the fibers and the fibers go into the stomach and then they translocate out into the abdomen and maybe you get an abdominal mesothelioma. So, and certainly it's 90% pleural, 85 to 90% pleural, about 10% abdominal and then the rest other places. So the pathogenesis of the disease is asbestos. How it gets to its place is extraordinarily interesting by migration and lymphatic channeling, mm -hmm. but the bottom line is we can, we can spend all day on that. We've got to figure out how we've got to treat this disease. What's in the pipeline? Where's research taking us? Something like this. I mean, you have to start at the beginning. First of all, how do you define how you're going to find this disease early? Because the surgeons who operate, the chemotherapy people who deliver, see that patients who are treated early seem to have an effort effect and live longer. So you need to find some non-invasive way. So we're looking at blood biomarkers, like many people at this conference have presented terrific work on looking at markers in the plasma, the serum, to try and find something that becomes elevated that should not be elevated, uh, that says something's brewing, you need to move on to the next step and maybe get a CT scan to see if you've got something going on. So that's for the early. For the already diagnosed patient, obviously if the patient is not a candidate for treatment, you must palliate that patient. I mean, there, there's a real, you have to make the patient comfortable. Take care of the effusion, take care of the pain. But for the patients who can be treated, then you make the decision as to whether they're going to get only chemotherapy uh, or whether they're going to participate in a clinical trial or whether they're going to get a combination of therapy. We've heard mainly at this meeting of combination therapies and the idea of giving therapy before and then operating and then therapy after. I want to mention an organization because I think it's just about the only organization that's out there to support patients with mesothelioma and their families. It is the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation uh, based in the Alexandria, Virginia area. Uh, research, education, support, advocacy, pretty important, isn't it? Marv is really the organization for advocacy as well as for research grants, has been, continues to be, is now, has elevated itself to be involved with all the major medical centers and provides an incredible service. What's the story with the law firms? Because as a general consumer, you know, or someone who will watch television or hear the radio, I'm very concerned that what's, what it's become is uh, like a mercenary opportunity rather than the urgent need to treat. Here are my feelings about that. I think you're absolutely correct. I think that there are degrees of, of PR that is seen. On the other side, I think that there is some effort though that these are elderly individuals. These are people that have worked hard and have s and saved their money, the little they have, and now they are going, their families are going to be left behind and they're going to need to have some way of surviving in the future. So in reality, 
to a certain extent, when, as we see the corollary in the tobacco industry sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, there needs to be advocacy for those patients that are truly injured so that their families will not be left with a tremendous health bill and will be able to be taken care of. And in fact, there are foundations that have been set up by these law firms that try to support research and try to unite investigators. And so, as with anything, they're all degrees. But I agree with you that a little less commercialism may go a long way. I'm wondering if there would be the chance to think about renaming the disease, rebranding this as a cancer in the minds of the public, because again, people have heard of mesothelioma. I don't think the average person understands that it is actually an oncologic condition. And I have to agree with you because the majority of patients who will present when they get the diagnosis of mesothelioma do not know what that is. And maybe that's the part of MARF and us as investigators to educate not only them but the public about you know, that this disease exists and this disease is more common than you think. I'm really happy that the group room could help raise awareness for the general public of this disease that needs a whole lot more attention. You're right. Thank you, Dr. Harvey Pass, Vice Chairman, Research Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery and Chief of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at NYU New York University School of Medicine. Thank you. Thank you.